Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a minute or two here. Um, please take this time to answer the poll question you see on your screen. Um, we will take questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to click on the question and answer box, it says Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll click there and type in the question. Um, and Dr. Ostrowski will answer those at the end. Thanks again for joining. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Just as a reminder, your lines have been muted. Um, if you just getting on now as I'm talking, go ahead and answer this anonymous poll um, before we get going. Um, my name is Kara. I work for Medtronic. Tonight, I have the pleasure of hosting this webinar where you'll get to hear from Dr. Andy Ostrowski. He practices at the Marietta and Canton Advanced Urology locations and is both a urologist and a urologic surgeon. Dr. Ostrowski is proud to serve his hometown as an alumnus of the Westminster Schools in Atlanta. He then graduated from the honors program at the University of Notre Dame. He went on to receive his master's degree at Georgia State University and his medical degree at the Medical College of Georgia. Dr. Ostrowski completed his urologic surgery residency training at the Mayo Clinic and focuses on improving patient outcomes with minimally invasive procedures. He specializes in all areas of general adult urology, including urinary stone disease, benign prostatic, prostat sorry, prostatic hyperplasia, urologic oncology, overactive bladder, interstitial cystitis, urinary incontinence, and men's sexual health and more. Tonight, Dr. Ostrowski will be speaking on overactive bladder, urinary retention, and fecal incontinence, otherwise known as stool leakage, as well as a therapy called Interstem that helps treat those. Shortly, we'll get started, and in the meantime, if you haven't already, please answer the survey question that's on your screen. A few reminders before we get going. Everyone's phones were muted upon entry. If you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the Q&A box in the lower portion of your screen at any time during the presentation. We'll answer those at the end. Please make sure to send those questions both um, to Dr. Ostrowski and myself and not just us privately or separately. Um, please don't use the chat function. All names remain anonymous otherwise. We will answer the questions, like I said, at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody for joining. Thank you, Dr. Ostrowski, for taking the time tonight. Well, thank you, Kara, for that great introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to get to speak with everyone tonight um, and hope everyone is able to um, hear me as well as uh, see the slides. Um, we'll do our best to cover any questions and, and make sure um, everything makes very good sense to everyone. So without further ado, we'll uh, start this up. Um, all right. So many of you uh, might have 
thoughts similar to what you see on the screen here, um, feeling concerned, exhausted, overwhelmed, uh, but too embarrassed to talk about your incontinence issues. Um, embarrassment is a very real issue of concern with many patients, as many as 44% of people uh, with bladder control problems and 50% of people with incontinence have not discussed that with the doctor. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think one of the most common questions you can see on here, you know, people are afraid to leave home, but will I ever be able to wear white pants again? Um, I guess as we fall into the, uh, you know, fall and winter months now, no one's really worrying about white pants, but, you know, come spring and summer, I'm sure that's going to be a very big topic. So if you're not alone, or just to remember, you're not alone and you are suffering from overactive bladder, um, there are things we can do to help. It's important to note that incontinence is not inevitable. Um, it is actually a disruptive health issue. Um, and so uh, these descriptions you'll see on the screen, these may very much sound familiar as well. Things you might not have thought were possible like uh, taking your kids or grandkids to lunch, sitting through a baseball game, just enjoying a good night's sleep again. These are all things that are within your control. Uh, these are all things that are obtainable. Bladder and bowel issues can be extremely embarrassing. They can have a significant impact on your quality of life. Uh, it may prevent you from doing the things you love to do. Um, you may feel like you are controlled by your bladder and your bowel. But again, always important to remember, you are not alone. Um, this is extremely common, both uh, overactive bladder and fecal incontinence. These are very common problems. It is more prevalent, actually, than vision or diabetes issues. Um, these are two con conditions that everyone thinks of as being extremely uh, common, and, and this is a bigger issue than those. Uh, bowel incontinence also affects up to 21 million adults in the U.S., Estimated number of U.S. adults that experience both overactive bladder and fecal incontinence system, um, symptoms are you know, astronomic. You may be asking, if this is so common, why am I not hearing about this? Why am I not you know, constantly inundated with things I can do? And the biggest issue is that most people are not talking about this. This is not common dinner conversation. This is not what you and your friends go out on a walk and just sit around and talk about how much you leak. And so this is something that becomes a very private issue. And as adults, we hold those things in close to the vest. I'm here as a resource for you and, and telling you these are things that are uh, manageable and I'm here to help with that. Many people manage their overactive bladder issues um, by drinking less, uh, wearing pads, restricting their social activities. Um, you know, from all of these problems, they see, you know, poor feelings of general health. They're losing that confidence that they normally should have in their uh, in, in their ability to hold um, urine back. And so there are things we are going to go over that can be done to help with this. And, and specifically, I'm going to give you sort of an outline of what I would recommend and what I find to be the most successful uh, treatment uh, courses. It's a good starting point for us to just talk a little bit about what causes bladder and bowel control problems. Um, you know, there are many potential causes. Um, some are as simple as the things you eat and drink on a regular basis. Um, many don't realize the medications or supplements you take could be the source of the issue. Um, there are life issues, life events that come to play like pregnancy, childbirth. Um, those are events that, you know, are wonderful, magical experiences, but ultimately do leave you with problems down the road. Uh, pelvic floor injury from those types of things or other injuries um, can also lead to these concerns. And so let's focus here uh, a little on the bladder side of things. You know, how does a normal bladder function? If essentially, there's a coordination between the brain and the muscles um, in your bladder, and this is all coordinated through nerve signals. As your bladder fills with urine, the nerves tell your brain that it needs to be emptied. The brain sends a signal to the bladder, and it tells the bladder to empty. The bladder contracts, almost like squeezing a balloon, and that normal bladder would empty. 
However, for some patients, as their bladder begins to fill, it's already telling the brain that it's full. The brain doesn't give you that time to get to the bathroom before it tells your bladder to go ahead and empty. We call that a sense of urgency. That overactivity of the nerve signals results in that miscommunication between the bladder and the brain. And this is how overactive bladder develops. The closer you get to the bathroom or you know, to that need to uh, empty, the stronger that signal or the contraction becomes, the stronger the urge. Um, and so essentially fixing that communication breakdown is the overarching goal of treatments for overactive bladder. And so unlike conventional treatments, which we'll discuss, the Medtronic bladder control therapy will gently stimulate the sacral nerves uh, in the pelvic area that control the bladder, uh, allowing for better and proper communication to be had. And so likewise with the bowel control, when your bowel um, is filling up and your bowel is sensing the need to empty um, because the digestive system has pushed through food through the intestine um, and that rectum becomes full, it will send those same signals up to the brain through the nerves to say, hey, it's time to empty. The nerves will signal um, from your brain uh, to relax the anal sphincter muscles and that'll send um, uh, uh, or make the ability for you to empty your bowels. Um, in the same miscommunication, uh, it's possible for the brain to be sending those signals too early or at an inappropriate time, um, hence incontinence can develop as well with the bowel side. And so in general, focusing back on the urinary uh, overactive bladder, there are three common bladder control problems, stress incontinence, urinary retention, and overactive bladder. Um, and so we'll take a closer look at each of these. With stress incontinence, uh, many uh, in the audience have likely had an episode um, or experienced something along these lines or heard of a friend or family member. Um, you know, they sneeze, they cough, they laugh, and a little urine comes out. Um, when they go to exercise or they lift something heavy, they're gardening in the yard, urine comes out. You climb upstairs, you get up from a sitting position, urine falls out. Um, this is going to have a huge impact on your life because these are activities that pretty much happen throughout the day. Um, stress incontinence is generally going to be more due to a weakened or damaged pelvic floor muscles. Uh, we discussed earlier about how pregnancy, childbirth can cause uh, that to occur. While there are some conservative measures that can manage um, stress incontinence, it does oftentimes need to uh, require a surgical correction um, to ultimately get to your goals. And so urinary retention, if uh, you know we're talking about incontinence, this is the exact opposite. This is uh, you know, basically a very frustrating situation where uh, you can't tell if your bladder is full or empty or not. It basically is not sending those signals at all. Ultimately, the bladder doesn't know or the brain doesn't know when the bladder needs to empty. Uh, and so you're unable to actually fully send a proper signal to stimulate the bladder contraction to empty. Uh, many people will see uh, a weak or dribbling stream, and ultimately that can lead to the need to use a catheter. So definitely a very problematic issue. Um, this can be caused by obstructive problems. And many men, uh, if there are any gentlemen in the audience listening, this is something that can occur for them. Um, and ultimately, this can become a very uh, stressful situation for the bladder. And um, damage to the bladder can, down the road, lead to overactive bladder symptoms as well which brings me right into overactive bladder. Um, you know, a common thing I hear in my practice, I never drink anything during meetings because I'm afraid I'm not gonna get up to the bathroom in time uh, when I suddenly have to go. Um, and so unlike stress incontinence, overactive bladder has very little to do with the loss of support. Um, it is much more that miscommunication between the brain and the bladder. And so uh, there's a couple of uh, definitions here I'd like to go over. So urge incontinence, that's the sudden need to go uh, to the bathroom, uh, which results in actual loss of urine. Uh, it's that I got to go, I got to go right now feeling, and you have five seconds to make it to the bathroom. Uh, you're, you're running to the bathroom, trying to hold it in, and you, know, you just can't keep it from coming out. 
Urinary frequency, um, this is when you are going to the bathroom often throughout the day. Um, then there's also urinary uh, urgency, which again, as we mentioned, is that symptom of having to go suddenly and strongly um, and not being able to um, you know, postpone urination. Um, you do often feel like your bladder is never empty. You feel like you can identify every single square inch of your bathroom because you are constantly running there. Nocturia is another common, uh, another symptom I'd like to mention. This is when you are getting up at night um, to go to the bathroom. And generally, it is a condition that would be considered abnormal for most patients. Um, you know, it is essentially a fancy word for going to the bathroom at night. Um, but that's a time of day when your body's trying to restore itself to rest. And we can certainly see that um, interfering with your lifestyle if you're not able to get that quality of rest. And so fecal incontinence, um, you know, very similar to urge incontinence, it's uh, with urination. It is that um, uh, situation where you have that inability to resist the urge to empty your bowels. And ultimately that urge uh, doesn't give you enough time to get to the bathroom and you do have leakage. Um, you know, this can be small amounts, this can be large amounts, um, you know, as any patient would tell me, any amount of leakage is too much. Um, and so definitely a concern. Um, passive incontinence, this is the inability to feel when you actually need to go. So it's almost in a sense that you don't know that there's about to be leakage and it happens. Um, and so if any of the following sound familiar, you know, you're planning activities around the bathroom, um, you have involuntary loss of stool, you have a stool always present whenever you go to the bathroom, sometimes not even having expected it. Um, you know, you always have uh, a staining to your underwear. Um, you're having to wear pads or other types of protective garments to um, compensate for this. Um, oftentimes, women also don't uh, even put two and two together that, you know, if you have recurring infections and incontinence of your stool, you know, a lot of that infection risk is coming from that incontinence. So certainly uh, concerns that many women do face. And so there are a number of steps that can be taken um, to find the best treatment for you. Um, ultimately, many people, by the time they're coming in to see um, a physician like myself, they've already tried lifestyle changes. Um, some may have even tried oral medications that have been prescribed by their primary care doctor. Um, I often hear, uh, uh, you know, many people have been on multiple therapies and they just are frustrated that it doesn't seem like their doctor knows what to give them. Um, in truth, it's not that they don't know what to give them, it's that this can be a challenge and sometimes it does require us to move towards advanced therapies to really get your situation under control. Um, everyone is unique, and so there is not one particular answer that will work for everyone. Um, and it's, uh, you know, my job as uh, the urologist, uh, if, if you would come to me to uh, seek care, it would be my job to help you along that pathway to figure out what would be your personal uh, regimen. And so I mentioned the lifestyle changes. Um, you know, this is usually the first thing anyone will have tried, um, basically changing behaviors to see if you can improve your symptoms. Um, and this could be changing what you eat, what you drink, um, you know, such as decreasing caffeine in your diet. Um, you could be getting more exercise, taking more walks, um, hopefully without the stress incontinence side of it. It might involve bladder retraining. Um, there are methods you can do at home, as well as methods that you can be taught through the use of different um, pelvic floor physical therapies um, that can help you to, in a sense, retrain your bladder. Um, many of these overactive bladder symptoms can develop from an early age, um, even from the time of potty training. Um, and so there can be learned behaviors that need to be trained out. There's also pelvic floor strengthening exercises, which are very important um, and can be done continuously throughout your day. I often tell my patients, uh, you're driving uh, to the grocery store or anywhere and you've stopped at a red light, that's a perfect opportunity to just take 10 you know, seconds to do a quick Kegel squeeze. Um, and so definitely something that you can implement throughout your day. 
when lifestyle modifications are failing to bring the results you are looking for, um, many times you will then be uh, introduced to the oral medications available. Um, again, a lot of times these are done through the primary care doctor before a patient ever even comes to a urologist, but you know, many patients will start with us and we will walk them through these same pathways. Um, oral medications, they do work, um, and you know, sometimes they can be very uh, helpful for patients, but uh, many times uh, patients don't find that it's offering them the full amount of success uh, and treatment that they're looking for. Um, and unfortunately, like any other medicine, there can be side effects associated with it. Um, you know, a lot of patients to me, their biggest complaints would be that medications have to be taken every single day, um, that they feel like the remainder of their medications they're taking as well, either interact with that, uh, the one we're prescribing or make it not work as well. Um, they experience side effects, you know, dry mouth, blurry vision or dry eyes, uh, constipation. Um, these are some extremely common, um, side effects that we'll see with patients taking anticholinergic medications. And there are other classes of medicines we often prescribe, um, some which also have a, a concern for hypertension or high blood pressure, um, especially in our patients who are already dealing with high blood pressure. That's a big challenge for us to um, constantly monitor for. Um, many overactive bladder medications actually can also cause confusion and memory loss. Um, early onset of dementia can be a potential concern that is certainly a factor we always take into account um, and, and always monitoring for that risk. Um, that was actually noted in a recent large study that was uh, provided um, uh, at the uh, National Institute of Aging, and that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association about that risk of developing dementia. So definitely a prominent factor in medicine today. Patients who are suffering from overactive bladder um, typically will tell um, us that they are not satisfied with the course of treatment, especially by the time they're coming to us. They're coming because they've been frustrated. Um, they're either only seeing you know, partial uh, benefits. Um, they're only seeing um, you know, intermittent treatment. They're, they're having good results, but they're getting side effects. Um, it's amazing how many patients will start into the overactive bladder treatment pathway, um, and then they won't follow up because they didn't feel like the medication worked and they gave up hope that there was anything that could be done. 80% um, of patients won't return for the second appointment, and 90% of patients won't return for the third appointment. Um, and anytime we do ultimately get to ask those patients or follow up with them down the road to find out why, the number one answer is always because I didn't feel like it was working. And so very important to remember that there is still hope. There is no reason to worry that there is not a, um, a successful option for you out there. It's just a matter of finding what is perfect for you. And so advanced therapies, as I mentioned, are where many patients go once they have tried medications, failed medications, um, or just aren't getting the overarching results they are hoping for. And so there are multiple different types of advanced therapies um, and three main areas that I would want you to consider. Uh, there's sacral nerve stimulation um, called uh, or with the um, inner stim device. Um, there are medications that can be injected directly into the bladder, like Botox. Uh, many have heard of that more for cosmetic sides, but in your bladder can uh, also be treated with this medication. Uh, there's also tibial nerve stimulation um, that can be an option. Um, and then, and again, for the bowel control side, not to leave that out, um, the uh, inner stim device is a very successful option for bowel control. There are other surgical options that would be more in the realm of a colorectal surgeon, but those are going to be surgeries that are much more invasive, much more in depth, um, and certainly something that um, would be sort of a more last resort type option. And so focusing a little on Botox, um, this is a uh, injected medication um, and essentially um, it is going to only temporarily offer uh, treatment to the overactive bladder by um, being injected into the walls of the bladder, um, into the muscle, and essentially um, triggering a slight paralysis to that, that muscle, uh, thereby helping to decrease the amount of overactive muscle um, working in the bladder. Um, 
this is essentially not going to treat that bladder, that bladder brain communication breakdown um, that we talked about earlier. Um, and so it is something that is important to know. It is more of a Band-Aid as opposed to a solution, but for some patients, it can work. Um, there have been studies looking at what uh, success rates or what long-term treatment um, you know, success uh, looks like. Um, and one of the studies showed 67% of patients discontinued their treatment after the first Botox injection. Unfortunately, one of the bigger side effects with Botox treatment is the is large risk of the need to self-catheterize. So as we mentioned, talking about paralyzing a muscle in the bladder, um, that muscle can certainly um, uh, only be a small portion of what the bladder needs to contract and empty. However, you know, there are times where that muscle turns out to be extremely important. And over um, a, the, the course of the few days after treatment, patients find that they can't actually empty their bladder. Um, and the medication can take, you know, up to nine months to a year to wear out. And during that time, until that medicine has uh, worn out its uh, uh, effect on the bladder muscle, patients may actually require the use of self-catheterization. And so always a concern that we have to keep in mind as we choose, would this be right for you? Sacral neuromodulation um, with the Medtronic Interstim Systems. Um, this is uh, an area I'd like to focus on with you. Um, essentially, this therapy um, helps to not only restore bladder, but also bowel function. Um, and it does so by gently stimulating the sacral nerves. So if you think about the situation like this, uh, if you're having dinner in a loud restaurant and you have difficulty hearing your partner, the background noise interferes with your ability to communicate. If you remove that background noise, you could likely hear your partner just fine. Essentially, this therapy works by delivering small electrical impulses that will block out those inappropriate nerve signals. It's getting rid of the background noise coming to the, uh, to the bladder. Uh, and go into the brain. And so if you get rid of that background noise, you're letting your bladder talk to the brain without interference, and that restores that normal communication. Um, and essentially, it is also going to be working the same way for bowel control. And so the Medtronic bladder control therapy, um, it is the only advanced therapy for overactive bladder that is clinically superior to medications. And one of the very uh, nice aspects of this device is that you can essentially try it before you buy it. You know, everyone always likes to know something's going to work before they commit to a treatment option. And so with this, there's actually a test run of the device that allows you to see, is this truly something that will help me? Um, in a sense, very much like a light switch turning on um, when this test is initiated. Um, it is a very simple, small procedure, um, similar to almost like acupuncture. Uh, and we are um, imitating the, uh, the, the stimulation to the sacral nerves and allowing you to go home um, and try this out for a couple days. Um, and many patients will see almost, um, you know, before they even are reaching home, that they have a difference in their ability to control their bladder. Um, and so certainly something that would be interesting um, for patients to try out because it will make such a life-changing difference to them if they can see that um, to help give them the confidence that's the right therapy for them. There are um, rechargeable or um, you know, recharge-free battery devices uh, to choose from, uh, and that would be something that you and um, I would discuss in detail and, and figure out what would be the right option for you. And so focusing a little bit on the test um, to allow to see if this is the right option for you, um, essentially what's done, as I mentioned, it's like a little acupuncture wire that's uh, placed down into the lower back. Um, and this is just uh, taped into the back, essentially uh, hooked into a little battery pack. And that's all subtly um, uh, situated in the back with this little strap device you can see. Um, and the, you know, Device can be worn under your curlos. You can go about your normal business. Uh, I, I tell patients that I want them to go home and actually just do their normal life activities. I want them to go to work if they go to work. I want them to pick up the grandkids if they pick up the grandkids. Go gardening, go out to dinner. The idea is I want you to actually be able to try this out in all of the life settings that you're normally seeing a bother um, in. Um, over 80% of people have achieved success at five years with this. 
Um, and if the test is ultimately a success for you, um, it would essentially be a move towards the um, actual device going in. Um, and you'll have a much better idea about how the therapy is going to deliver the relief you're looking for. Um, if the device doesn't provide the uh, expectations during that initial test, um, there's actually um, kind of an intermediate test that you can try that's a little more um, uh, long term. You know, it can actually last up to 14 days. Um, and so we sort of call that a, you know, kind of the next option, you know, still allowing you to try it out with a little more detail um, before you actually know that it's uh, something you want to commit with. And so Medtronic's devices um, are a proprietary SureScan MRI technology, um, and that's what enables patients um, able to get full body 1.5 and 3 Tesla MRI scans. Um, you know, that's a groundbreaking uh, change for these devices that you know, previously for patients who maybe had to get an MRI of their back or something of that nature okay. were unable to have um, that MRI without either having the device removed um, or would have to have found a different way to uh, get the imaging done. Um, these scans are allowed, uh, you know, even if you've had out of range impedances, which is something we would talk about. So again, it's a very, very um, wonderful technology and really a game changer. Um, there's a MRI mode that you can activate basically when you would need to have an MRI um, it, on the uh, handheld device that comes with your um, stimulator. You can basically just make a little change. It's kind of like a little Samsung cell phone. Um, and it's almost like you open up an app and you're able to just push a button that puts it into MRI mode. So very easy to activate and then deactivate. And so what makes someone a good candidate for the Medtronic Interstim uh, bladder or bowel um, device? Um, so essentially, if you have significant symptoms, uh, think urge incontinence, urgency, frequency of urination, or bowel incontinence, um, or if you have that non-obstructive variety of urinary retention, which is essentially um, where your bladder just isn't getting the correct nerve signals to empty. Um, that could make you a very good candidate for this therapy. Uh, in general, um, there are steps that you know, anyone should try before they get to a therapy like this. Um, that would include trying lifestyle changes, making sure it's not a simple change that can address your issue. Um, you know, we always recommend trying medications, making sure that you know, that is definitely something that won't work for you. Um, and generally, when those treatments haven't given you the relief you are looking for and, and getting you back to living your life uh, the way you hope to, um, that's when I would consider moving on to such advanced therapies as the Interstim device. And so in general, um, this is a therapy that you can trust. 84% satisfaction among those who use it for bladder control, um, three times greater improvement in the quality of life compared to medications. 89% of people uh, using this for bowel control are seeing long-term success as well. Um, and so this is definitely a therapy that many, many, many people are benefiting from. Um, and as people become more aware of the options, this is the only way they'll ever be able to start reaching um, the goals they're looking for and, and getting back to their life. Um, and so anytime I can be of assistance, I'm always happy to do that. Ultimately, this is the number one goal. In my clinic, we are trying to make sure patients are not living in the bathroom. I want them out enjoying the world. I want them out enjoying this beautiful fall weather, um, trick-or-treating coming up. I want patients being able to go out there and either walk their grandchildren around the neighborhoods for trick-or-treating or be there ready to open up and not have concerns of having to rush to the bathroom when it's time to hand that candy out. Um, again, this is just getting you back to your life. And so while getting an evaluation with a urologist like myself is always going to be a first step in getting you um, worked up and evaluated to see if this would be the right therapy for you, um, Medtronic does also offer an interstim patient ambassador program, um, essentially allowing you to talk and chat with uh, real live patients who have gone through these therapies, um, learning you know, what was their life like before, see what commonalities you have with them, how has Interstem changed their life? You know, what have they seen result from this therapy? Um, at what point did they know it was the right option? These are questions that everyone's going to be ask, asking and wanting to hear from someone who's been through it. 
Um, you know, when did you know it was the right time to do it? How did the procedure go? How did you recover? You know, these are things that I can give you answers to, but a lot of times, you know, patients will also be able to answer in a way that you're looking for. Um, and ultimately, you know, did you reach your goals? How is your daily life at this point? And so anytime you have an interest in that, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Medtronic. Um, they will be more than happy to set um, you up with an ambassador. And so I do very much appreciate everyone for taking time out of their evening to join us um, with this uh, slideshow. Um, I hope it was informative. I hope uh, maybe I've touched on something that uh, might be of interest to you or at least provided you food for thought so that you can start um, reaching your treatment goals. Um, if I can be of service in any way, um, please do not hesitate to reach out the number on the screen um, when we can help get you scheduled for an appointment. Um, again, um, it was my pleasure to speak with you guys tonight, and I'll uh, open it up to any questions we may have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Ostrowski. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and launch another poll, um, and then we'll I'll read the questions to you that we have here from the audience. All right. So now is the time if you do have questions um, to type it there in the box that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you don't mind answering this poll question here, it just asks if you'd like to make an appointment. Um, someone from Advanced Urology will reach out if you would like to do so. Okay. Question number one, Dr. Ostrowski, what success have your patients had through bariatric treatments? Can you hear me? I apologize. I had still a mute. Um, <laughs> uh, great question. And so, you know, one of the hardest topics for anyone to broach and, and truly is a, a challenge to, you know, really reach patients on is weight. Weight is a big issue in the um, U.S. And, and the world in general. Uh, and, and how that affects the bladder and the bowel is, um, you know, extremely uh, severe. You know, the more weight hanging on to your bladder and pushing down, hanging on to your bowels and pushing down, that's absolutely going to be um, a challenge for patients. Um, with bariatric surgery and finding that, you know, you can get that weight down, that can have a huge effect on your ability to um, empty your bladder more, uh, you know, efficiently. Where uh, bariatrics may not have much of an impact is if you already are at the point where the bladder is overactive, um, which can occur when you've had years and years and years of, uh, you know, damage from excess weight pushing down and just the inefficiency of emptying. Um, unfortunately, at that point, the bariatrics, while very much a healthy choice to move forward with, may not control the bladder um, entirely. Um, and there's many, many other factors that can, um, just from the bariatric surgery, lead to the overactive bladder becoming slightly worse even. Um, and so there's basically going to have to be a individual evaluation per patient to really see if that's something we expect to see a benefit from. Um, many times it's really just one step in the process to getting patients to their bladder goals um, and bowel goals. And so um, while I definitely would encourage that, if that's something you're considering, you know, and, and definitely for your um, long-term health, a very um, uh, possibly a great move, um, you know, for your bladder, it may not have as many of the benefits you're looking for um, and certainly something we'd be able to help with if that's the case. Thank you. The next question is, does insurance cover the inner stem therapy? That is a question I'm very happy to answer. Um, almost a hundred percent across the board. You know, as, with my experience, I, I really do feel like this is something that many, many insurances prioritize as a good option. Um, again, this is where having a specialist who understands um, overactive bladder, as well as finding the right patients for it is so critical. Um, in the you know, environment of our uh, world with the um, way inter, uh, insurance companies operate, um, sometimes patients feel like the challenge is always, you know, them against their insurance. Um, fortunately, at the Advanced Urology, um, where we're an interstim center of excellence, we have teams of people who uh, essentially uh, devote their time every single day to ensuring insurance is covering this for our patients. 
um, and our team of doctors, you know, especially myself, um, have a very strong understanding of what would be required documentation wise, as, as well as just, um, you know, picking the right patient who would be a good option for this in order to ensure there's no hurdles with the insurance to have to clear. Yes. Um, next question is, can urinary retention be helped with pelvic floor physical therapy? There certainly are going to be some types of pelvic floor physical therapy that, you know, and, and some types of uh, retention that may be benefited. Uh, many times patients, um, and, and this is generally, you know, something I would see in younger patients, but um, certainly of any age who have very tight spastic pelvic muscles, um, that may be a little hard for your bladder to overcome emptying through. Pelvic floor therapy can help to relax those muscles um, and essentially take away that obstructive process. So certainly possible, but urinary retention in itself, um, you know, not something that will, uh, for most patients, be um, you know truly finding benefit with the pelvic floor therapy. Generally, does require more uh, advanced options. The next question is. Uh... Can I go back to work after the test? And so in general, I would say, yes, my, my goal would be for you to be able to um, get back uh, to the normal activities. You know, if you work for a living, I'd want to see that you can do some of your activities. Um, the day of the procedure, um, I generally would not recommend it. You know, I would say the following day would be the day you'd be getting back to work. Um, and essentially the thing you would have to watch out for, you know, if your job does entail um, doing a lot of heavy lifting, um, I would want you to tailor that down simply just to make sure that um, you don't inadvertently uh, pull on a wire or something happen that you know, basically makes your test no longer work. We'd want to ensure that everything you're doing um, would be allowing you to best judge the test. Um, and that those would be details that I'd be happy to work out with you individually. Um, you know, when patients do come in and they're asking these same questions, I'll talk with them about their normal daily activities, what they do, um, and, and I'll sort of coach them through their individual experience so they know exactly what to expect and, and what they should be doing. Excellent. Um, the next person asked two questions. What if, what happens if the unit malfunctions and are there any restrictions of activities while you have the implant? So in general, if there is a malfunction, um, it is you know, always possible that that can occur while not common. Um, we do see that. Uh, there are um, many options for revision and, and, and replacement um, and insurance in general will always, uh, you know, uh, be something that doesn't you know, interfere with that. Um, you know, ultimately we would have to assess, is it the uh, battery device? Is it the wiring um, that needs to be replaced? Um, it's very simple components, very simple procedures to you know, revise if needed. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, much less than what is initially required with the procedure, which is a pretty simple option in and of itself. So um, the answer overarchingly is yes, that can occur and we can fix it. Um, realistically never been a situation that I've not been able to find a, a good resolution one way or the other. Um, it really, again, just comes down to each individual problem and, and triaging how we should solve that. Um, and then what was that second question? The restrictions? Yep. Are there any restrictions of activities while you have the implant? In general, um, I would say no. I mean, this would be something that once the implant's in and, you know, I generally ask patients after the, the actual implant is placed, um, to give two weeks of, you know, just kind of light activity, taking it easy to ensure that everything heals imperfectly um, and, and you're really getting the benefit you're looking for. Uh, beyond that, I, I generally want patients to get fully back into their normal activities. Um, things that, you know, I would personally not recommend just picking up if it's a hobby you hadn't had already would be like kickboxing and, you know, big contact sports where you're just going to be, you know, kicked or impacted directly on the site of the implant. Um, not necessarily because I think it will interfere. I think it would just hurt. Um, but realistically, uh, I, I want you being able to go back and do all the things you love in life. Um, you know, I have patients who are horseback riding, um, you know, and they, they love doing that can, uh, and will continue to do that. I have patients who are rock climbing, patients who are deep ocean divers. Um, I've had stories galore of all patients, you know, with some of the most interesting uh, um, life and, 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 you know, hobby activities. And, and I'm encouraging every single one of them to get back into those. Excellent. Um, next question says many times I can't make, can't make it to the bathroom in time, but if I'm out and about, I can hold it for several hours. Why? 
And so there are a lot of uh, psychological triggers, um, especially in the home. I'm pretty sure everyone on this uh, meeting right now has experienced a situation where they're driving and they're able to drive for two hours, but the second they see the front door of their home or they're pulling into their garage, it's like their bladder just goes crazy. Um, or other times you hear water rushing. And so things like that, that can trigger the bladder. Again, it, it basically creates a situation where neural activity going from the brain to the bladder is coming at a hyper-stimulated mode. And, and these are things that are abnormal. Um, ultimately, those might not have, uh, or those triggers might not exist out and about where you're doing your normal activities. Um, other times it may also just be that you are much more distracted when you're out and about and you're able to block out those abnormal signals. Um, other factors include the fact that at home you're probably drinking more because it's readily accessible, whereas when you're out and about, you know, you're not just carrying around all that, um, you know, glass of water or, or, or beverage. Um, and so definitely a lot of factors there, but very, very common um, to see that and certainly a, a, an overactive bladder problem that um, falls into our clinic on a daily basis. Next question is, says not to be vain, but I'm interested in seeing before and after inner stem placement. I have not had great success finding this in my Google deep dive. Could you describe how it changes appearance anatomically or a site where I could find this? In regards to a site where you might be able to find that, our uh, Medtronic reps may um, potentially have a, a resource on that measure. Um, but ultimately, the goal of this is to actually be about as subtle as possible. Um, and so when we do place these, we are always um, trying to keep these in areas. Um, it's generally placed in the um, kind of lateral edge of your buttock. And so it's going to be underneath the bikini line, I like to say. Um, that's really where we try to strive and keep it. We do take the contours of your body into account to make sure that where it's getting placed isn't going to be, um, you know, right in the middle of a natural fold where you'll have um, different uh, angles of your body's muscles contracting and, and bending and, and getting in the way. Um, we take into account that it's not going to be where you're sitting so that when you sit down, you're not feeling like you're on top of a uh, big piece of plastic or metal and you're not sitting on an item. Um, in general, the incision for these uh, uh, is extremely small. Um, most are under four centimeters um, for my uh, cases. Um, and so the placement um, is very subtle. We generally um, don't expect there to be any sort of a bulge. Um, many people have seen uh, pacemakers placed and you know, up in the chest, the pacemaker basically bulges out like a sore thumb and it's you know, extremely obvious that there is something foreign underneath the body. Um, in general, many of my patients, if they were to uh, suddenly go join a nudist colony, people would be looking at them and not noticing there's something back there. Um, and I do even have a lot of patients who can't even remember what side it's on. Um, and it takes them a you know, 10, 20 seconds to just to find it um, because it is buried down into the fatty tissue and it's able to um, sort of blend into the body. Uh, I don't know about a resource specifically where you could find uh, images of incision sites, but I would encourage you to uh, go to that Medtronic patient ambassador um, and and poten potentially they'd be able to you know share their experience. Um, next question is, how do you determine if there's sacral nerve damage? And so uh, with sacral nerve damage, one of the things that we might find, um, you know, let's say at the time of a test, um, if we're not getting the responses we expect, there are actually little cues um, as we are uh, placing the leads for the device um, that we are looking for. We are uh, looking to see different um, uh, mechanisms of muscle contraction um, when we stimulate the device um, during the testing placement. And so if we're not seeing those um, signals come through properly, properly, uh, that could be a sign of sacral nerve damage. Um, certainly, um, you know, failure of the device to work at all could be a sign of sacral nerve damage. Um, in that instance, if there was concerns along that line, Unfortunately, that would be an area that uh, would be outside then of the urologic perspective, and I would um, you know, be getting you involved with a neurologist at that point um, you know, to maybe further work that up and also see if we can work in conjunction to find a better solution for your problem. Excellent. Um, this person said, if you have had surgery for bladder control, can you have a second one if it stops, question mark, during hysterectomy? I'm kind of confused by what that means, but maybe 
Well, I, I mean, I'll take it as I, I'm interpreting essentially, yes, if you've had work done on your bladder before, you know, many people have had a, a bladder lift or um, maybe they, you suffered from an injury during a, a childbirth um, or you had your hysterectomy and bladder um, was either suspended or even damaged during that. Um, ultimately, there are still ways that this can help um, and, and fully expect, I would say there are many people who um, have had, you know, one or more other procedures done for their bladder. Um, before they ever consider inner stim. Um, and, and it helps to speak just to the evolving nature of um, bladder issues. You know, what might have ailed you 10 years in the past uh, may no longer be the problem. And, and it might now be something that more inner stim uh, could find a solution for. So um, definitely having had prior issues um, would not be something that would deter me from considering this option for you. Um, definitely, again, would have to be something I'd evaluate with you um, on an individual personalized basis. But um, certainly nothing that I think should prevent you from um, seeking uh, more information. Okay. Um, the next person asked three questions. They first said, great information, Dr. O. Um, they want to know if Merbetric medication is an issue with dementia as a side effect. Um, they said they know it has high blood pressure as a side effect, but is early dementia also one? And can you have the Medtronic implant after having a radical prostatectomy? And so with the uh, first question, you know, speaking with the medications, many medications, you know, can have a lot of different neurologic effects. That's that's the first thing I want to start with. Um, just in general, medicine is uh, always going to have that potential um, to interact with the way your body functions. And that could be your bladder, your bowels, your stomach or your brain. Um, and so you always have to take that into consideration when you are putting a, a medication into the body. Um, in particular, with that article I had referred to where um, the American Medical Association had documented about the uh, significant concern for um, early onset dementia, that is specifically more with the anticholinergic class of medications. Um, Beta-3 agonists like uh, Merbetric would not necessarily or, or are not in that category um, and so therefore would not have been included in that risk um, assessment or risk concern rather that announcement. That being said, you know, when we do counsel patients on Mirbetric, it is not one of the primary concerns that we are worried about. But again, any medication can have that. And Mirbetric, um, certainly um, with the way it affects the bodies, um, there can always be that potential there. So we always have to take that into consideration. With uh, the answer to the second question, after a radical prostatectomy, um, I, I have very many patients who I have done that procedure and actually... Uh, very interesting, had just recently consulted on a new patient for that exact same concern. And I have others who are actually coming to see me in the near future um, as referrals from their spouses for the same concern. Uh, and so definitely a very common um, finding for patients to have overactive bladder after that. There are other urologic issues that can occur after the prostatectomy. And so um, I would definitely encourage you to you know, seek consultation and I'd be happy to help um, you know, differentiate the different issues that could be occurring and help you to pinpoint what exactly the pathology is and how we could fix it best. Excellent. Um, next question, not really related to overactive bladder or fecal incontinence, but they asked when riding a bicycle for extended periods of time, the male private area feels numb. Is that normal? So not necessarily normal, not something that, you know, should occur. Um, it generally is an indication of um, increased pressure um, onto, you know, certain nerves um, and areas in the pelvis, um, you know, especially for men. Um, prostate inflammation can also occur from that, which definitely leads to a lot of urologic issues and urinary concerns. So um, certainly something that I would recommend um, if that is occurring, um, you know, definitely get an assessment, see what's going on. Sometimes it may be essential as, as simple as just changing the bicycle seat or the posture during your cycling activities, but oftentimes it can also um, indicate more issue occurring underneath the skin and um, uh, areas that would uh, you know, best be evaluated with a urologist. Um, the next person says that they're a patient of yours um, and that you've prescribed them medications that's new to them and it's been very helpful. They haven't mentioned to you in the past that fecal incontinence 
incontinence uh, or that they feel like they had fecal incontinence. They didn't really know it was a thing and they just thought that they had diarrhea um, and they'd like to talk to you about it at their next appointment. So I will get you that patient's um, name. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and definitely, um, you know, one of the big uh, uh, downsides of fecal incontinence is that there are not very uh, good treatments out there medically, you know, medication wise to help with that. And, and certainly the overactive bladder medicines are not uh, really intended or prescribed to help with that. So we generally would not see that. Um, this, this is where a lot of patients do actually switch over to the interstim device because they sometimes will find that it kind of kills two birds with one stone. So um, I'll be happy to uh, get that information from Kara and we can certainly bring that up um, at, at our next visit. And, and if you would like, uh, even in uh, move up that visit so we can get to that sooner for you. Awesome. Um, next question is, is interstem better than oral medication? Not the side effects. I have a smaller kidney. So in general, I would say that interstem is going to be more successful for patients than medications. Um, you know, and that is just my personal experience, but also experience as seen in many different studies. Um, you know, there are just better uh, ways to manage the bladder with the inner stem um, that medications often cannot get there. Um, but it also comes down to the question of what is the success you're looking for? Um, you know, while many patients may see their urologic issues resolved or improved with medications, um, what they don't mention or why they may stop it is that, you no, know, they, while the benefit was there, the side effects were unbearable. Um, and, and many patients, I would say the number one reason patients stop medication is actually going to be first that it didn't help. And then second, very close behind that the side effects made the benefit completely not worth it. Um, and so, um, definitely something to consider one of the, um, you know, best things that a, you know, a, a good skilled urologist can do is to assess first and foremost, are you a patient who would be at risk for those side effects in the first place? Is there a contraindication to the medications? Um, you know, one of the questions earlier asked about insurance coverage and certainly one of the factors that, um, insurance will always look at when we consider advanced therapies are what has the patient tried before, or did they have contraindications? Um, and so that would be something that we would be assessing individually with you. Um, and again, one of the um, advantages that we here at Advanced Urology, um, with our experience, um, we really do have a very solid way of um, you know, getting you to your ultimate treatment goals uh, and getting these uh, little um, intricacies figured out. Next one says, no question, just a comment. Great presentation, Dr. Ostrowski. Thank you very much. Um, I agree. Uh, last question so far is, says, I have the device to my bladder. Will this same device help fecal problem? Kind of answered that, but maybe just touch on it. Definitely. Again. You know, it's something that absolutely can. And so, you know, a lot of patients don't really, uh, as the question earlier um, was mentioned, that they didn't realize that they were having incontinence. They just thought it was diarrhea. It absolutely can help a problem that's there that you didn't realize was already occurring. Um, I would say that, you know, there's a little bit of an unknown whether it's helping to solve a problem before it ever uh, became an issue. Um, but definitely, if there was a communication barrier between the brain and the bowel, um, the interstim device, just in the way it's helping to manage the bladder, um, it's the same way we'd be installing it to help install or help uh, res restore good function with the bowel. So um, definitely would expect it to be a benefit. Excellent. Um, at this time, if anybody else has any more questions, go ahead and submit that. Um, there is one more question. Uh, this patient, um, I believe they're a patient of yours, um, says that they do have the inner stem implant. Um, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it helps his issues. Um, they want to know if constipation can cause bladder issues. And they said that they have an implant and they've tried it on all the programs. Um, at ev every level with no results? Excellent question. And so um, highlighting one of the key principles that uh, many people do miss uh, in, in how the bowel and the bladder play a role to each other. Um, one of the biggest triggers of bladder problems um, for many, many patients, especially you know earlier in life before they've had a chance to have other events occur that have damaged the bladder, um, it is their bowels. And so constipation is a huge trigger of bladder issues. Um, and one of the you know the benefits of the interstim device is that it really 
really can control, um, you know, the the main issues that are occurring. But sometimes, you know, especially bad constipation that can overpower even the device. Um, and and oftentimes, I'm chatting with patients more about fixing constipation to help with their bladder problems than I am even about treatments for the bladder. And so uh, many people look very uh, cross-eyed at me when I start bringing up, uh, you know, laxatives and, and, and stool softeners thinking like, I came here to talk with you about my bladder. What are we doing here? Um, but it's just to highlight how important that is. Uh, in regards to the device, um, uh, definitely there are programs that are uh, set and available for patients on their access level. And so um, on the programmer, you have the ability to make changes at home. Um, and, and I would say that these are considered uh, what we would call the simple changes. Um, you know, we want you to have flexibility to be able to adjust. Um, but we have it within our own pro, uh, uh, company, um, as well as the Medtronic reps, um, especially Kara, who's on the phone or on the call with us right now, uh, who are essentially next level, you know, um, users of the Interstim programmers and are able to actually access different programs, uh, manipulate many, many different settings. Um, you know, even in the programs you have, there are countless numbers of ways that we can actually manipulate and adjust those settings. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we have to get very deep into the physics of what is actually happening with the stimulation. Um, and so that's something that at that level, we would actually always recommend, uh, scheduling an appointment with, um, you know, with our team, um, Sarah Stefano, who, um, I hadn't mentioned yet is my uh, physician assistant who, uh, I work, uh, hand in hand with, uh, with these devices, um, Sarah's been doing this for three years uh, and, and really is our guru when it comes to um, really diving deep into the programmers. Um, and then when she's getting stumped or there's issues she hasn't been able to solve, um, that's when we will bring in our Medtronic reps um, who are able to um, you know, help sit down with our patients. Many times we'll spend over an hour with patients going through the program, um, answering questions, but also really uh, fine tuning everything. Um, and it is a continuous process. Uh, you know, our bodies keep changing. Um, and so what might work for a patient of settings uh, at this moment in time, five years down the road, uh, may not be the right settings and we have to keep up. Uh, and so when we do have these implanted, we always recommend um, you know, regular appointments every six months for us to keep assessing and making sure you're getting that best one. Um, what I would encourage for this particular patient um, is that we can get your contact information. And uh, what we can do is have you come in and, and start working on getting those settings changed and, and really um, fine tuning to get the results you're looking for. Excellent. I think that's a good idea. Um, next question says, how often is resurgery required due to catheter movement or other issues with placement? Uh, and so uh, by catheter, I would uh, presume you're talking about the wire that is actually the um, uh, communicator, I guess, what's bringing the signal to the nerve. Um, in general, the uh, rate or when we would actually normally need to operate, it does depend on what device is put in. But, um, you know, my um, uh, usual implant that we're using is the battery device. Um, and we'll often see patients um, who are having... Um, continued success and, and battery life lasting, you know, up to 15 years. Um, some will even see more, you know, where the device uh, in its current uh, battery and MRI safety um, hasn't reached 20 years of um, being out on the market in this particular form, but we're expecting and hoping maybe there will be patients who are seeing 20 years of benefit before a battery change is needed. Um, again, there's a lot of differences in how long the battery will last, depending on what settings you are at. Um, I am proud to, uh, you know, have most of my patients um, at very low settings, and that has a lot to do with their anatomy and, and where we're placing it. Um, and essentially, the lower the stimulating settings, the generally, the longer that battery can last. Next question is, are there any age restrictions? Realistically, if you are a surgical candidate, if you are healthy enough um, to have a you know procedure done, um, then uh, there is no real restriction from my standpoint. I have operated on a 94-year-old um, placing this in, and they continue to be extremely uh, pleased with the results. Um, I have even operated on people in their 20s, um, and so uh, certainly um, something that you know kind of spans all age ranges. Um, realistically. It's more just uh, uh, 
each patient's um, physical attributes and ability to you know, withstand the procedure. And if it is the right uh, solution for them, uh, generally age shouldn't play a factor. Yes, I will just add that um, safety and effectiveness have not been established uh, for patients under the age of 16, but that's certainly a, up to a medical professional's uh, decision if they felt that was necessary otherwise. Um, next question says, I'm having a urodynamics test in a few weeks. Is it horrible? For many patients, it's not. Um, it is a very good test. One we didn't go into great detail, but for the benefit of those others on the call, uh, urodynamics is essentially one of the um, uh, often used testings to see what exactly is happening at the level of the bladder. Um, we're able to actually in real time see the pressures and uh, muscle activity of the, the bladder muscle um, and, and study how voiding occurs uh, for a patient. It's done by placing a small catheter about the size of a coffee stir, a stirring straw into the bladder. Um, and that fills the bladder with water um, that's sterile and essentially mimicking um, uh, urine production. Um, and as we fill the bladder, we're measuring pressures within the bladder. Um, generally for women, there's a, a, a vaginal catheter that is measuring abdominal pressure um, or a rectal catheter for gentlemen to measure that abdominal pressure. And that, that abdominal pressure um, is how we are measuring when patients do urinate, um, you know, are they using abdominal muscles? Is, there, is their bladder basically having to recruit other muscle groups in order to empty. And there's a lot of other data that we can gather from this test. In general, very, very quick studies, you know, do not take more than about 30 minutes to do. Um, and ultimately, um, while yes, it can be a little awkward of a test, um, really most patients do not find any substantial discomfort. Um, and it really is just you know, the discomfort of uh, having to feel that urgency to need to go to the bathroom and allowing us to diagnose it. So the urodynamics patient would also like to know if they should take their Merbetric up until the time of the urodynamic test. Uh, and so that's a great question. Um, and, and many different physicians will probably give a slightly varying answer. Uh, in general, with my patients, what I like to do is if they are not getting excellent results or benefits from the Merbetric, um, and our goal is to see, you know, what is happening, what's the, the problem, what's the continued issue that needs to be managed. Um, and then I, I would say certainly, you know, keep on Merbetric. It's really just about what data we're trying to find. Um, if a patient has really excellent results on Merbetric, they're doing great and there's absolutely no problem or any medicine, I should say, and there's no problem that needs to be addressed. Um, in that situation, it might not be um, needed to move forward with the urodynamics. And so for most people, uh, they're moving on to that kind of a study, um, either because they're curious what's happening with their bladder or they've not found success with those treatments. And generally by then they've already stopped those treatments. Um, but there's certainly no harm in taking the medicine. It's just good for the urologist who is then going to be interpreting the data to know that you are on the Merbetric and that may um, affect you know, sort of what their rec recommendations or what their findings uh, really are telling you. Okay, next question. Uh, patient says, you stated that there are no restrictions on the inner stem device regarding activity, so it's not similar to an ITB pump restrictions like skydiving, hot tub, scuba diving, since there's no medication or reservoir, I'm guessing. Uh, essentially, you know, and in, in, to my knowledge, no, um, shouldn't be really anything. There is no reservoir. There's no um, uh, uh, pressure situation that, I mean, has to be concerned for, um, you know, essentially these are activities that have their own inherent risks, but, um, uh, you know, essentially something that you should definitely talk, you know, with your provider specifically about, especially if there's certain circumstances that might affect your recovery, um, affect your ability for the uh, device to continue functioning. Um, but, you know, many, many, most of my patients, I, I really have not had any issues having to stop them doing their normal activities. Um, I will just add that scuba diving um, or hyperbaric chambers do have some pressure restrictions with the inner stem, um, so patients shouldn't dive below uh, 10 meters or 33 feet um, or enter hyperbaric chambers above uh, two uh, atmospheres absolute. Um, and all of this information is given to anybody who had given an implant, so you would know which activities were restricted. Um, there's one more question. 
person asks, do many people have the inner stem implant removed due to no success? Very few, um, simply because of the fact that we are running through that test first. Um, you know, if the trial run with the device doesn't provide success, um, you know, either the discussion at that point would be to move on to a different, you know, conversation about a different therapy, um, or to try uh, what we call that advanced test, you know, a little more long term trial with it. But again, ultimately, you would have found success already uh, when doing those trials. And so patients who are moving forward with the device are already seeing benefits. Um, it's extremely uncommon for patients to have made it all the way to the uh, stimulator device um, and, and then not find success at that point. Um, I would say just to kind of highlight one area, um, I would say if anyone was to you know, get to that point, um, it often is going to be patients who are dealing more with the non-obstructive urinary retention um, because that is a, an area that it can be very challenging to, to really make progress on. Um, and usually, you know, if patients are not seeing great benefits from it, it's not necessarily something that must be removed. Um, oftentimes patients are having it removed for, you know, other concerns or personal reasons, um, but not uh, necessarily that the device is causing any issue. Awesome. All right. Well, that is the last question for this evening. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ostrowski. That was really great and informative. Um, and we just appreciate your time. And thank you everybody for joining. It's my pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining and look forward to meeting with you. Have a nice night.